Before we do the uh, the ghusl, let me just go over the f things that uh, that you shouldn't do if you uh, if you're not in wudu. So um, you sh you can't do you can't pray. You can make du'a, but you can't pray. Uh, and if 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 we'll do the section on uh, tayammum, but if you if you don't have tayammum or water, then the prayer is uh, it's not binding on you, according to the Malikis. So they, I mean, they give the example of somebody who's in jail, who's like locked up on the wall with chains or something. They can't do wudu. Um, so you can't, you can't, and you can't do tawaf because tahara is a condition. It's a shart. لِسَحَةَ tawaf It's a necessary but not sufficient uh, condition. The um, the sa'i, on the other hand, if you're making sa'i, you can do it without wudu. But the tawaf, you have to be in wudu. And, and uh, that he covers that in the section on the... Also, what's that? Well, if you... Yeah, for the same reasons that you had... You can. Yeah, for the same reasons that you would do... Uh, will do and then also the uh, uh, you, you should not touch the uh, the mushaf and that includes even a portion of it or uh, a verse uh, and it includes also uh, the 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 uh, fatay and mushaf or if the mushaf is in something you shouldn't touch it without will do and mutaharun only people in a state of tahara should touch it. Um, if the mushaf has tafsir in it, it's permissible. So like Yusuf Ali, English, English that has the Arabic, it's permissible to, uh, to touch it. Um, it's also permissible if it's being transported. So for instance, if it's in a trunk, even a non-Muslim could carry it uh, in that case. Um, you know, there's rules relating to the mushaf. You shouldn't carry it into uh, any, you know, like a, a toilet or something unless it's covered. So if if you had like a jacket that has a zipper, then you, you could take the mushaf into a bathroom. Or it was in a, a, like a briefcase or a purse if the purse had a zipper or something covered. But it can't be open to the air uh, in the same place that... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you should do wudu. You shouldn't touch it. The the mushaf is uh, uh, it has a hurma. You know, sanctity is very high, um, and also it is prohibited for somebody uh, who's uh, you know in a state of hadith al asghar the lesser or the greater. To they should not write the Quran or even a verse of it. Um, so, um, and then that includes also, uh, if, you know, like I said, if the, if the mushaf was with some things that were being moved, then it's permissible to move it. So if it was with, you know, if you're moving some things and it's one of those things, then it's permissible to move. But if it's the mushaf on its own, uh, it's not. Uh, yeah, you shouldn't write a verse of Quran. Yeah, you know, the, the electronic media is a problem. I mean, I, I asked Sheikh Abdullah bin Bay about that. Uh, you, you should treat a mushaf that's on CDs or something, you should treat it with respect, you know, because on the one hand you could do a qiyas that it's like uh, somebody who memorizes the Qur'an, so, because it's ready at hand, it's actually not present, so on the CDs it's digitally there, but it's actually not, you know, there's, there's no physical evidence of it being there other than that once it starts playing, but I mean, those are codes, and 
you know, words are codes as well. It's, it's just uh, those codes aren't, you know, they're not the most half technically of what we have. I mean, it's a problem, you know. It's definitely, so it's, it's usually better to err on the side of caution and just treat it. I mean, I had teachers that, that uh, treated the CDs like a most half. Yeah, no, exactly. Now we've got MP3. I mean, I've got the whole Quran on my iPhone, you know. So that's what I mean. But it's not, it's ready at hand. Do you know what I mean? You have to pull it up. So it's, it's encrypted. Well, it's like, a, you know, a Qari is somebody who's ready at hand, you know. I mean, it's uh, like if you ask him for an ayah, he'll give you the ayah. Well, it's, it's similar, to, <laughs> you know, to the... So the, the Qari can go into the bathroom and, you know, he doesn't... <laughs> he has to do what he has to do as well. So the, uh, you know, the, the Qur'an being in the heart is not like the Mus'haf. The Mus'haf is a physical... You see what I mean? So in that way, there's a physicality, but then there's a non-physicality because it's it's uh, it's really it's not right there, but it's it's ready at hand. You can pull it up. Uh, so in that way, it's similar to like memorization. I mean, it's definitely a new thing. I don't. I don't. You know, I I Sheikh Abdul, he wasn't. Uh, you know, he just said it's better to, to respect it than not to, you know, than to consider it normal. Yeah, but when you don't have it pulled up, you don't have to compare it. Well, that's what I said, and he liked that analogy, because, I, you know, I use that as an analogy that, and he, 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 he you know, he, he thought that was an interesting way to look at it. But uh, it's definitely encrypted in there. You know, I mean, it's encrypted, so there is a physical reality to it on those things. But one could argue that it's encrypted in the Hafiz as well because that memory is, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's actually, there is memory. Like when, when you memorize something, you're actually creating neural pathways. And uh, the neural pathways are there. Yeah. So, I mean, you can forget things, but the actual neural pathways are, they're just, it's like a file that's, it's deep down in your filing cabinet. You know, it's not that it's not there. It's just you don't have the access that you used to have, or it's lost in those files. It's somewhere. I just don't know where it is. So, mm -hmm. Would you say that when, for example, Islam is kind of taking offense to this, and then it says taking the Quran as the Quran? Well, the Maliki's a menstruating woman can read the Quran. Yeah, it's not, it's not, there, the, Imam Malik's the only Imam from the four that, that was his position. And, and his argument was that Hayd cannot, you can't use the analogy of Janaba because Janaba is something that people can remove at will if they have water. And if they don't have water, they can remove it with Tayammum. So, whereas a woman in Hayd, he, he argued that technically she could uh, be, prevented from reading the Qur'an half of her life, her adult life, because her hayat could be 15 days. So he said that uh, that a menstruating woman sh can recite Qur'an. Well, I mean, the, the, the dafa is, it's better to do it on a kursi and uh, it's better to use, to get, you know, khuruj an al-khilaf mustahab. To get out of differences of opinion is a is an encouraged thing. So because there's a prohibition with the other imams, it's better to use taf, uh, like a you know a Yusuf Ali that has commentary or a, or Jalalain to use something that has commentary. And now they have nice you know they have uh, sectioned Qurans with commentary on the side, and they're like a they're you know it's like a mushaf. So that's what I would do. If if you're if you're yeah if you're maintaining your uh, Quran, then it's permitted for you to read from the Mus'haf. 
when you're in yeah menstrual cycle. Yeah. Yeah, they can recite without wudu, like children, when they're learning the Qur'an, and they can hold it as well. Not the mushaf. Just like that one juz. Like the loah or a portion, exactly. Yeah, they're permitted to do that. So, uh, you know, the, the uh, a menstruating or a po woman who's got lochial bleeding uh, can, can do that also. If they're learning, like if a, if a, if a if the, and that's the important, you know, the difference. If she's maintaining her hevel or she's learning the Qur'an, do you know, then she can touch it. Okay. Uh, and then also, uh, you know, as if it has tafsir, then there's no prohibition because it's not considered a mushab, it's considered a tafsir. Uh, and that includes somebody who's... Um, you know, in the state of Janaba, they can carry a tafsir as well. So the uh, the section on uh, ghusl, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ يُنُبًا فَاتَّهَّرُوا If you're in a state of uh, uh, Janaba, then purify yourselves. A state of Janaba is uh, the Hadath Al-Akbar, which comes from uh, the iltiqa, you know, al, uh, the the meeting of the two circumcised. I mean, the uh, the Arabs call they say the two circumcised, but they really mean the the, the male, because the Arabs call when when there's two things uh, that are together, then yaghlub ala ahadhuma. You know, they use the name. Uh, so you say have like al-ma al ma wa tamar is called al-aswadan. Water and dates are called the two aswadan, the two black things. There's really the dates that are uh, black. Um, you know, the, in the Maliki Madhab, circumcision of a woman is not, some of the Maliki say it's makruma. Um, Imam uh, Asid Ahmed Zarruq said Moroccan women, they didn't do it in Morocco, and he said it wasn't necessary. So it's it's kind of a khilaf issue, but they're, they're uh, it's definitely not a clitorectomy. I mean that that's that has nothing to do with Islam. Uh, that's like a, they actually call that pharaonic circumcision. So it was a pre-Islamic thing that Coptic Christians did, and you find it in uh, Sudan, uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, some of those places where you get what was called a pharaonic circumcision, which is not. The, uh, the 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 makruma of in, in was something that the Prophet ﷺ permitted for the Arabs because the Arabs used to do it before Islam and, and they came and they asked him and he said you can do it but don't just just make a cut you know don't don't uh, so it's like a you know it was a little cut that they made uh, on on uh, on a woman and some say it comes from Sarah that when uh, when uh, Ismail was given uh, when when uh, Ibrahim salam was given the the uh, circumcision. She asked for something for the women, and uh, and you know Ibrahim was given the uh, the the earrings, like the the piercing the ears, and then Asara. Yeah, but Ibrahim was revealed to him to tell her to pierce the ears and. Um, So the uh, the ghusl is, I mean, a ghusl in the Arabic language means washing. So it's used for maghsala is the washing machine. Uh, ghusl is is to wash. The ghusl specifically, as a technical term, is to wash the entire body with the intention of making the uh, 
the uh, prayer permissible with rubbing. So that's the definition. The entire body, which means all of the skin. So down to the, in the hair, you go all the way down. And uh, it, it's, uh, it can be wajib, it can be sunnah, or it can be mandub. So you can take a ghusl, uh, you know, even if you don't need one. Um, you need a ghusl from janaba, which is to be in a state of uh, ritual impurity as a result of the meeting of these, of the, uh, the glands, which is the tip of the male organ, uh, meets the labial folds. So there's a there's some level of penetration, even if it's a, a small amount. But if the glands goes into the labial folds, then uh, they, the, both of the people need ghusl. So it's not simply an orgasm or uh, it, there, there has to be penetration at some level. Um, and then it's uh, also for a woman who's in menstruation. And menstruation technically even though menstruation, hayl in Arabic, is not in fiqh, it's not exactly menstruation because there are certain types of hayl that are not considered menstruation by medical science, but they're considered menstruation by, uh, like a pregnant woman can have hayl according to, in the books of fiqh. Whereas, you know, obviously in, uh, in, uh, in a Western sense, they can't. So hayl is generally menstruation but not completely and there's in Maliki Madhab when you get into spotting I'm going to do a section on menstruation um, so I'll, le let me uh, go through this now and then the, the nufasa is the blood of lochial bleeding which happens after uh, pregnancy if a woman gives birth and she bleeds up to 40 days um, she can bleed and that blood prevents uh, prayer so those are the things that you make the uh, the ghusl. It's a sunnah on the day of Jumu'ah, on the Eidain, on the Ihram for the Hajj or for the Umrah, and also to wash a dead person. Uh, and some of them say that it's actually an obligation. So that's the mashhur of the madhab is that it's an obligation to wash the dead person. And then it's mustahab for uh, tawaf, for sa'i, between Safa and Marwa. Uh, for being at Arafah, Muzdalifa, um, and then washing from the blood of Istihada, because uh, even though Istihada is, you know, blood that three days after your normal cycle, you call that Istihada, which um, in, uh, it, it's, uh, it's like, a, is it menorrhea? Menorrhea? Istihada? Menorrhea. I mean, what menorrhea is the blood that just flows, right? Yeah, it's menorrhea. So if you have uh, menorrhea, which is women who bleed excessively, even after they've had their menstrual bleeding, they, and it's usually from a there's 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 a uh, you know there's there's veins in the um, in the actual uh, womb that bleed because it can be treated through cauterization. They go up and they treat it. So there are women that have this uh, uh, this pro medical problem. But the, now you can treat it, but you know, obviously, in these days, you you, you couldn't treat them. So women that bleed, uh, if it's if your normal cycle is five days, then when you get to eight days, it becomes istihada. So that means that the uh, the blood uh, that flows after that is not considered menstrual blood. So you you resume praying, you do ghusl and resume praying. You can have sexual intercourse. Uh, it's normal, so it's a, it's it's a, it's encouraged then when the istihada stops to do ghusl. You don't have to, you know, because it's a, it's not technically hayat uh, menstruation, and then also uh, to go into Mecca and Medina, uh, all of those things. Some of the ulama, uh, if you're visiting one of the righteous people, you know. Would do ghusl just to visit one of the awliya or the salihin uh, to go into their um, gathering, um, and then the uh, the obligations of ghusl are you have to have an intention at the outset. So again, it's niya, and part of the you know in 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 the deen, so much of our religion is based in the mal'amaru biniyat. So it's really becoming uh, uh, present to intentionality. If you look, most people in the world don't really do things with intention. Like, if you ask people, why are you doing this? 
you know, they, they have loose understandings of why they do things. I mean, people, you know, do things for reasons. But the intention in, in the deen is so strong. It's such a strong element. Uh, Ibn al-Hajj, who, uh, al-Abdari, who wrote a book called Al-Madkhal, um, from, from an uh, indication from one of his teachers, Ibn Abi Jamrah, he wrote a four-volume book. Uh, and he, he did it because his sheikh said that, that he was saddened by the fact that so many people lost opportunities in their lives because of the absence of intention in their actions. And he said he wished somebody would uh, write a book about rectifying the intentions. And then he looked at uh, Ibn al-Hajj. And uh, Ibn al-Hajj said he realized he was kind of telling him he should write the book. So he wrote that book. And it's an amazing book because it's, uh, it's basically he, every profession he deals with and shows how their profession can be a means to actually gaining reward with Allah. It doesn't matter what they're doing. You know, there's, there's a, uh, you know, Adam Smith argued that, um, you know, that the butcher is really selfish. That's why he's, uh, that's why he's, he's become a butcher to make money. But he said his selfishness benefits the rest of us because he's making money off a of social service. So even though he's doing it for selfish reasons, it benefits everybody. Ibn al-Hajj is the exact opposite. He's saying the butcher has an opportunity to be doing his work as an act of worship for God by making his intention to provide halal meat for the Muslims so that they can get energy, so that they can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he actually shows how just your job that is an ordinary job can actually become an opportunity to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, uh, and that's why intention is so central to, to, uh, to our religion. And so in the ghusl, the intention is, you know, Ibn Arabi said about, about the sexual act. He said that it was, it was on the one hand, he said it was actually um, a, a, a spiritual. I mean, he saw it as a very spiritual thing because he said it was, it was that desire to, for unity, like the desire for the opposites to come together, the jamal and the jalal, which are the, the two ways in which Allah reveals himself to the creation. So he saw it as this desire for these two... Uh, these two theophanies of God in the world to come together and to unite. But he also saw it as this ultimate state of forgetfulness so that, um, that people go into such uh, forgetfulness that the ghusl is a way of bringing them back that, that because Allah is ghayur. So there was so much uh, pleasure found in, in other than God you know, in, in the mate, that it was, the ghusl was a way of restoring that presence. That, that's the way, I mean, that's the ishara, you know, but that's the way he looked at it. So, doing the ghusl, it's a sunnah to do it after uh, the intercourse. If you do not do it, you should at least uh, clean from the, uh, you know, the najasa, and then do uh, uh, wudu. You can do wudu. It's not a wudu, la yarfa'u al-hadath. It doesn't remove the hadith, but it's a wudu that the, the angels of mercy uh, remove themselves from people that are in a state of janaba, And so it's a way of, uh, of uh, so you, know, you just do a, a wudu before you go to sleep. But you should do something in, instead of just having the intercourse and then sleeping. It's better to, uh, you know, to have some type of washing. And then the famous story of Abu Huraira, who once was in a state of Janaba, and it was from uh, seminal emission in sleep because he wasn't married at the time. But he saw the Prophet and then he hid, you know, because he was ashamed. And uh, the Prophet noticed that he, like, hid behind a, <laughs> a wall. So he saw him later. He said, well, what'd you, what were you doing? And he said, oh, I was in a state of Najaba. I felt ashamed. And he said, a mu'min la The mu'min doesn't, you know, it's... It's, in other words, like your spiritual state is still purity. Like a believer doesn't go into a state of impurity. His, you 
It's called Al Madhal of Ibn Al Hajj. It's an amazing book. When I've spent like a couple years just reading that book all the time, it's one of my favorite books. But he just covers everything. I mean, he's you know, he show, he, like street sweepers. You know, they intend to keep the streets clean of impurities so that <laughs> people don't get their clothes soiled by impurities. The bookbinder intends to preserve knowledge. And I mean, he just shows how everything can be made an act of uh, devotion to God. And historically, that's the way, like if you go into Fez in, the, in those old... Uh, Titus Burkhart in his book on Fez, the Sacred City, when he was there, because he was there in 1932, you know, he mentions how people really had that understanding, because he would talk to craftspeople. He, he once was, was uh, talking to a man who was making a comb, one of the horn combs from horn, you know, from the animal horn, and he was making the comb, and he, he asked him about it, and he said, what, he asked him what he thought of the, the new combs that they make. He said he didn't like them. And he said, why? And he said, this, this was taught to us by Idris, the prophet Idris. He was the first one to make a comb and give it to the people. And he said, and, and I learned this. I learned how to make this from my teacher who learned it from his teacher who learned it all the way back. And he said... To take that out, you know, to take that from, because that's tradition. I mean, tradition extends even to crafts. And he said, for, and he said, now they just make all these things. And he said, people won't appreciate it. He said, people, when they buy my comb, he said, they keep it for their whole lives and they actually appreciate it. And that's one of the really interesting things also about the Prophet Sallallahu is that he named things, you know, stuff. Like now, stuff is all, it's all uh, disposable. And, and, and when, you, when you appreciate stuff, you're going to appreciate people. But when you, when you have a total lack of appreciation for stuff, the, the, the next thing is to have a total lack of appreciation for people because people become utilitarian. You know, like stuff, you use people. So this idea, the Prophet him named things, like he named his comb. He had a comb, like, where's so-and-so? And he was personalizing stuff. And even though he had very few things, he honored them by naming them. Now we just, it's all throwaway. Everything's throwaway. And people don't appreciate the world itself, that the world has value. Things in the world, stuff has value. Books have value. You know, uh, uh, sh uh, somebody asked Sidi uh, Abdullah uh, Hajj Ibrahim, one of the great scholars of West Africa. He said, um, "You know, how did he get such a big opening?" He said, "He said, well, one thing I have never put knowledge on my calf. <laughs> you know, just like he never put a book at that level." You know, just the adab towards knowledge, the adab towards books. I mean, now things are, it's all thrown away. You know, people use things and, mm -hmm. You know, the, if you, in Syria, putting a book on the ground, you get whipped almost by the teacher. I mean, I, I always marvel, like, when I was at the university, I would see kids sitting on their books. Do you know? I mean, if you did that in a madrasa, they would just really, I don't know what they would do. You know, you know the idea of sitting on, on knowledge like that. But, uh, you know, in West Africa, they're looser about that just because they're floor people. So I think it depends on, like, I'm, I'm a floor person. I don't really have furniture in the house. So we're on the floor. So for me, having a book on the floor is not, it's not like a, because uh, I, I read and, I, and my books are on the floor. But if you're in a culture of, you know, table people, then you shouldn't put books on the floor. So I think it, it goes with the orf. Because my teachers, like in, in West Africa, did not have a problem putting a book on the floor. But they're floor people. Obviously, the most half, I wouldn't do that. And that's why, you know, they have the kursi traditionally to carry, hold the most half. That was for floor culture. So you always kept the most half off the floor. 
So I think it goes under orf, you know, like the, it would be the custom of a people. What what's proper adab with this? So if you know if if you if you're in a culture with all furniture and you have a book on the floor, it's aib. So the uh, removal of state of greater ritual impurity, fulfillment of an obligation, in other words, to fulfill the fard, or rendering worship permissible, istibaha. These are just different ways that you can uh, that you bring to mind your intention at the time that you're doing the ghusl. And then obviously mu'alat, the continuity, the fawr, rubbing the entire body with water, penetrating all of the body's hair. So getting down into, so that the hair actually goes down to the, uh, and that would include for a woman if she's got braids, removing the braids so that she can uh, uh, penetrate down to the hair. And then making sure to reach all the hidden places like the inguinal folds um, and uh, between the buttocks, the creases of the knees under the armpits, the folds of the inner thighs between the buttocks, and inside the navel if you have an inny as opposed to an Audi. Uh, and then washing what is difficult to reach with a towel or something similar. So for heavy people, people that can't reach their back or there's people that don't have that flexibility, they can use... Uh, a towel if it's you know if it's really difficult they can actually somebody else can help them uh, do that and then some of the additions that Sidi Khalil mentioned uh, is is just washing and rubbing between the toes that that's an obligation which is the sunan of ghusl uh, are rinsing the mouth, wash the hands at the outset, lightly sniff water into the nostrils and blowing it out, and then wipe the outer canals of both ears. So you don't go into the inner canal, but you, you take water and you, you put it there so that the whole, and then you wipe inside and just get the outer canal. So you don't try to go into the ear. Uh, and then washing it. Uh, <coughs> Then the mandubat are begin by washing off all the impurities. So the najasa that came from, uh, you know, the s s semen and the rutubat uh, al-farj, like the um, uh, the discharge from the woman, you wash that uh, from you know, the thighs or wherever it is, and then uh, and then saying Bismillah, washing the head three times. Commence with the parts washed in wudu, with the exception of the feet. You wait for the feet to the last, but you do the parts of the wudu. Conserve water. The Prophet used a asa'a, which is four amdad. So the mud is half a liter. All right. So the Prophet could do ghusl then with two liters of water, which is not a lot of water. So again, con water conservation is good. I mean, you know, pe people take showers in our culture for. Uh, to take, you know, just the enjoyment of taking a shower. So, um, but a lot of water is wasted. Uh, begin from the top down. Wash the right side first. Uh, begin by cleaning the genitals, and avoid touching the genitals thereafter with the inside or the sides of the palms and the fingers. If one happens to touch the genitals, or if anything occurs that nullifies wudu later on in the ghusl, then repeat what had already been completed of wudu or repeat the entire wudu if one touches the genitals after completing the wudu and then return to the ghusl. So if you break the wudu during the ghusl, then you, you do the wudu or do just what part of the wudu that you, you had done before. And then Khalil says, and begin washing the head from the forehead, which is the same as in wudu as well. So ghusl is, is required after. So, I mean, the Prophet ﷺ took a ghusl with a pitcher of water in, in a uh, tub. And he also took ghusl with Aisha radiallahu anha. So uh, you can take a ghusl with your spouse. Um, Aisha said, the Prophet never saw my genitals, I never saw his genitals. And that, that's adab, that's not um, for normal, uh, you know, it's, that's permissible to look at the genitals of your spouse. But the Prophet sallam, out of the adab, the intense adab, and uh, Haya, um, Aisha said that about him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But they did take ghusl together, so it is permissible to do that. Um, and they did not have showers, so this was a, a, a washing. Um, 
and which you know, I, I mean, where I lived mo in most places when I was in the Muslim world, the, there weren't showers. So, um, but it's similar. And then you wash, you know, you begin by washing your private parts, cleaning that area, do the the uh, the wudu, except for the feet, wash the head, get in, make sure that the water penetrates down, and then the ears, you know, the neck all around, and then like the back, so getting your back so that you make sure you rub because delk, you have to have delk on all parts of your body and then go down the right side and then the left side and uh, and then that's the ghusl and then doing the same, you, you know, once you leave, if you're in a bathroom then uh, you can do the tashahud, the shahada when you get outside of the bathroom. If you're in an area where the the shower is separate from the bathroom um, then you, you can say do the dhikr. Um, in that. So, also is required after menstruation, postpartum bleeding, orgasm in which fluid is ejaculated. So, that includes a wet dream, um, it includes masturbation, anything that you, you have seminal emission. And then the penetration of the glands penis in any private part. So, that includes uh, you know, rectal, which is absolutely prohibited. Uh, male, female, male, male, uh, animal as well, any bestiality, anything. But, you know, people do these things. That's why they mention them in the books uh, of fiqh. And then also entering Islam in the state of one of the previous four. So when you become Muslim, you take a ghusl, one of the first things that you do, and then learn about uh, najasa, um, tahara, so which is important. And then the physical state requiring ghusl, janaba, prohibits the following. If it is caused because of menstruation or postpartum bleeding, then intercourse is unlawful until ghusl is performed. The, the Prophet said, used to go to uh, his wife when she was in menstruation, and she would wrap in izar, and he would not go under the izar, but he would uh, dally with her. So it's permissible to have... Uh, uh, you know, foreplay and intimacy, but it is prohibited to have intercourse during that time. What's called mufakhada is also permissible, which is, um, you know, like a, um, the, you know, the thighs of a woman, something like that. Th those things are permissible, but actual genital penetration is prohibited during the time that she is uh, in her menstrual cycle. Um, and then it... Uh, if it is from the last two points, three and four, in the previous section, then the recitation of the Qur'an is unlawful with the exception of a few ayah recited for protection like isti'adah. So if it's uh, uh, from the postpartum bleeding, uh, uh, if, if, if it's from orgasm or penetration of the glands, then you cannot do any uh, recitation of the Qur'an unless it was like to do isti'adah. Uh, or something, seeking refuge in Allah, ayatul kursi or the three quls. Um, all four prohibit one from entering a masjid. So if you're in a state of janaba, you cannot go into a masjid. Um, additions from uh, Khalil, the prayer, touching the mushaf of the Quran, circumambulating the Kaaba, making tawaf. If, someone is if something is forgotten during the ghusl, then treat it as if you would your wudu, except what you need not repeat what was already performed. So you just go back to that limb or whatever you forgot. And then uh, Sidi Khalil mentions on the clarification on the different types of doubt. If there is doubt in regard to a discharge, whether it is many or medhi, so if you don't know, if you, if, if you wake up and you have discharge and you don't know if it's many or medhi, you assume it's many. So you do a ghusl for that. Also, you don't have to do a ghusl for discharge, for ejaculation that comes from some kind of, uh, it doesn't relate to, um, to the normal means. So, the, I mean, they mentioned the books of fiqh like riding a horse or riding a camel or something like that. Sometimes uh, that, that will cause an ejaculation. That, that, that just means they have to wipe, clean themselves, but it's not, doesn't necessitate ghusl. If it's urine or medhi, then consider it medhi. If it's many, medhi or urine, consider it medhi. Um, so order of ghusl, when performing ghusl, one should follow this order. Start by saying bismillah, 
if you're in a pure place. So if you're in the bathroom, uh, then you should not mention uh, the name of Allah. If you have a shower that is separate, like, you know, it, there's a door, not a curtain, but a door that closes, and so the shower is actually in a separate place, then you can uh, mention uh, dhikr of Allah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you don't use the toilet? You know, it's, it's Nia. I mean, it's a bathroom. I don't know. But, you know, the toilet's the toilet. It's kind of a low thing in our culture. So, I mean, obviously the point is the Najasa that's in the place. So, you know, if you feel comfortable with it, you know, it's like, it's like tur turkey bacon. <laughs> you know, if you feel comfortable with it. <laughs> yeah, if there's no najasa, it's per it's permitted, you know. I mean, I would maybe put something over it or something. I would just, you know. Because somebody could go in there and use it. I mean, you might not use it. Somebody else might use it. What's that? Yeah, no, exactly. So if you go into a Syrian bathroom, you probably would. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they are the cleanest bathrooms, aren't they? Yeah. I would say if Muslims would only keep their public spaces as clean as the private spaces, you know, it's really interesting. Because you, know, you go to Muslim countries and, like, the outside is so dirty, and then you go in the houses and they're so clean, you know? <laughs> I was with uh, somebody in Morocco, and we were in <laughs> we, <laughs> we were in the Zawiya, and uh, you know these guys were doing dicker, and they were such a mess, you know, and they all had like half their teeth were falling out, and they all had like yellow teeth, and you know, and their jalalas were a mess, and but they were just so full of light, and you know they were singing these qasaid and things. And when we left, my friend said to me, is, uh, he said, SubhanAllah, you know, you go to like America and everybody's outwardly clean and all their teeth are all brushed and their hair is all... And he said, but, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're addicted to this. <laughs> they're, they're on Prozac and they're, or they're, you know, like uh, infidelities to their spouse or what. I mean, he just went on about just the inward states of people. How, how, like these people, he said it was kind of the opposite, you know. <laughs> Outwardly, they're just a mess. But inwardly, they're like, the, you know, these really pure people. And it was, it was just really accurate description, I thought. <laughs> What's that? No, no, you, I mean, yeah, that's a natural. You're not, the heart is, it's like having the Quran in your heart. You know, you, you don't, you don't guard that. And you can make that niya, you know. It's just saying the name because it's a, it's you know, you're bringing it out. Yeah. So uh, then, wash the right hand up to and including the wrist three times. The left hand up to and including the wrist three times. Wash the genitals. Remove any impurities from the body. Do this with a focused intention uh, to remove the najasa. So you always intend to do that. And then removing a state of greater ritual impurity. So you make the niya, fulfillment of obligation, reten, uh, or rendering worship permissible by removing a preventative. Rinse the mouth three times. And again, you know, these are all symbolic. Imam al-Ghazali goes into detail that, you know, it's pur purifying your mouth from anything that you said that was like backbiting or anything that was done incorrectly, your eyes from anything you saw, your nose from anything, you know, foul that you, you know, there's, this is all, uh, and then wash the face thrice such that the water penetrates the skin beneath all facial hair that rub the hair, t hair rub together. Wash the right hand up to and including the elbow thrice, making sure to wash and rub between the fingers. Wash the left hand like the right. Wet the fingertips and massage the scalp from the bottom up before washing the head. Wash the head thrice. 
start by pouring water onto the head. So if you have a shower, obviously it's coming down anyway. And work the water into the scalp using fingers, ensuring all the water is wetted and rubbed together. Wash the right ear once, place water into the right hand, lean your head like that. So you put the water in the right hand, lean your head so that the water covers the ear, right? The inside of the ear and then you go, uh, and behind the ear, the ear pin eye, this is the pin eye and behind the ear. Wash the neck once, wash under the chin, wash the right arm from the shoulder to the elbow once, including the armpit. Wash the front and the back of the right side of the body up to the knee once. Reach all the hidden places of the body between the folds of the right inner thigh between the buttocks. Uh, wash the left arm from the shoulder to the elbow. So now you do the same thing on the left side. And then uh, wash the right, and then finally washing the feet. So you wash the right foot up to and including the ankle, wash between the toes, starting from the little toe moving to the left and then l the washing the left foot up to and including the ankle, same way that you did the right foot. So that's pretty much ghusl. I mean, it's straightforward. I wouldn't obsess about it. You know, it's not... Um, with the water. So you, you, get, you, you, know, you get the water and then go in, and then you just wash over it. Yeah, just making sure that the water penetrates yeah, so that you, you get the water in the scalp. Yeah, and then you wash the, the water. Like you do, like you would do, you know, you wash the water and just do that. But before that, you actually get in to penetrate down. Uh-huh. And men with thicker beards would also comb their, their beard. You have to, yeah, if you have a beard, you have to get in if it's thick. I mean, normally in wudu, you have to do that if you have a light beard. But with ghusl, you have to make sure you get down to the, to the root so that the water penetrates. So that's ghusl. And then the tayammum uh, is earth ablution. The, uh, the Prophet said, uh, The earth was made as a place of worship for me and a source of purification. And so the tayammum is earth purification. Uh, it's in place of water and um, it is simply to do the ritual, uh, the lustration, before you uh, pray. Um, so tayammum can be done with anything which is sa'id al-ard that's on the earth. Um, and it's, it's, very, it's, it's not a hard thing to do. It's very simple. Um, the, the Moroccans tend to use rocks uh, to do it, but um, it's basically, uh, you know, you do it, the reasons for performing it are fear of harm. So if there's death, like, for instance, one of the Sahaba had a cut on his head in a battle, and uh, then he had a, um, he had a seminal omission that night. And the next day, his, his wound had dried. And uh, the next day, he wanted to do tayammum. And, and the people that were with him said, no, you have to do ghusl. And he said, I'm worried about the wound. And they didn't. And he ended up doing ghusl, and he died because the wound started bleeding again. And when they got back to the Prophet, they told him. And he said, qatra sahibuhum qatrahum Allah. You know, they killed his, their companion, you know, uh, and, and wronged him greatly. Um, and he said, had they only asked, you know, it was something where they shouldn't have given an opinion because they didn't know, but he was actually right. So the Prophet was very upset about it. And the point of that is that, you know, these things are done as, uh, you know, to make things easy for people. So, in fact, uh, Sheikh Khatri said that he knew the Sunnah was practiced in a place when he saw people doing tayammum. Like if you go to South Asia or a lot of Muslim countries, nobody ever does tayammum. The only place I've ever seen tayammum done is Africa. That's the only place I've ever seen it done. Nobody in Pakistan does tayammum. And that's a sign that they're, they're not following the Sunnah. 
because it's done for a reason. The tayammum was given for a reason. So if you fear loss of limb, increase of illness, somebody who has the flu or somebody who has uh, a bad cold and they're worried about, you know, it's cold out and they're worried about getting pneumonia or getting from doing the water. Uh, or in the dawn period when it's really cold. Like when I was in North Africa, West Africa, uh, during the winter, you know, we were living in tents out, so it was freezing cold. I mean, I always did uh, 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 wudu, but there were a few times where I needed to do ghusl, I did tayammum. Because had I done ghusl in that type of thing, I, you know, so I was afraid of getting sick from, from that. So, um, and then delaying the healing of an illness. Uh, an ensuing illness from the use of water, lack of water. So if you don't find water, then it's permissible to do this. So, and then at akhdari includes, and this is important too, if the prayer time is about to go out and you will lose the time in doing wudu, so there's water available, but you're going to lose the prayer time, prayer time is over the water. So you actually do tayammum. So if the sun's about to go down, and you have to go to the bathroom to do wudu, and you're going to lose the, the asr prayer, then you just do tayammum right where you are. So uh, rules for uh, praying with tayammum, only one obligatory prayer can be performed. So it does remove, it removes the hadith, but temporarily. It's not like wudu which removes it until it's broken again. It only removes it temporarily, enough time to do your prayer or recite your Quran or what you're going to do. And then the funeral, sunnah, or nafila prayers can be performed in conjunction with the obligatory prayer. If it is performed immediately after the obligatory prayer. So you don't do it before, you do it after. So you can do an extra prayer after, but not before. You'd have to do a separate tayammum for the obligatory prayer. Uh, it is permissible to perform tayammum for a nafida independent of the obligatory prayer for both a sick person and a traveler, but not for the healthy resident. So if you're residing in a place and you're healthy, there's no reason to do tayammum, you don't do it. The healthy resident can perform tayammum from any far prayer except the Friday congressional prayer unless he knows he will not find water before the end of the prayer. In such case, one may perform tayammum for the Friday congressional prayer, congregational prayer. So... Uh, the um, uh, when you're traveling, the healthy resident can perform tayammum for any far prayer except the Friday congregational prayer, unless he knows he will not find water before the end of the prayer time. So if he'll miss the prayer and he's not going to find water, but otherwise he has to go and do it. In such a case, one may perform tayammum for Jum'ah if you're going to lose the prayer. No, if you're going to lose the Juma, the Friday prayer, because the Imam's going to finish. Yeah. Say that he's in the second rakat. And if you know by going and getting your wudu, you're going to miss his, then you can do tayammum. That's why in Morocco, they have the big rocks in the, in the masjid, right? They always have them there, because that's a sunnah to do that. But people don't, in Pakistan, you'll never see a, a rock in the masjid. <laughs> Oh, you, in Hanafi, you can't? Hmm. Rock is much better. What, what do you mean? Yeah, it is the exception. You can put that if you want. If it's not clear to you, it's clear to me, but it might not be clear to some people. So just add it in there. The last rakat of the imam. Was my <laughs> I mean, the, the Juma prayer time is the prayer because you're either going to get it or you're not. <laughs> huh? Got it? You can, you can put it in there. Come on. It's fine. It, look, if you had a hard time with it, somebody else is going to... I know, but not for Juma. The end of the prayer time is when the Imam finishes the prayer. Yeah. But if it's not clear, you can put it there. Because if, if you... 
with the genius Husseini brain, there's other people that are going to think the same thing. So go ahead. Obligations of Tamum are uh, wiping the face, wiping both hands up to and including the wrists. Intention at the first padding of the earth. And that's called darba, which is proof that darb in Arabic means a pat. Right? Like in the Quran, you know, wadribuhunna, like pat them. Yeah. It's not like, that's not how you do tayammum. <laughs> it's just a, you know, it's like a, it's just a, you know, come on, snap out of it, girl. <laughs> so wiping the face, wiping both hands up to and including the wrists, intention at the first patting of the earth, and it's one of the following. An obligatory tayammum, so it's a fard, or rendering worship permissible, istibaha. If one is in need of ghusl, then one must intend rendering worship permissible from the janaba. So if, if it's from a ghusl you're doing tayammum, you have to have that knee in your heart of removing the janaba. If one is in need of wudu, then rendering worship permissible will, will suffice. So the first patting of the earth is an obligatory one. The second one's the just a the, the uh, sunnah. Continuity of action using pure earth, which includes soil, sand, adobe, stone. So like an adobe house that's not glossed over is permissible. You know, if it's not uh, fired adobe, it has to be the raw earth adobe. If it's, hmm? if it's painted, you can't. Yeah. And then salt marsh. You know, if you salt marsh, it's like out where there's salt. The, you know, in a marsh area, they have the salt, the white. You know, that white that's permitted, but not wood, baked plaster, grass, straw, precious stones, gold or silver. So you can't do it on grass. Because it has to ha reach the earth or be from it. So, uh, and then following the tayammum immediately with the prayer. So you shouldn't have a delay between the tayammum and the prayer. And the prayer time having entered, it cannot be performed for a given prayer until the time of that prayer has entered. So it has to be in the prayer time. You don't do it before the, the tayammum and then wait till the time comes in. And then uh, Khalil adds, removing any barriers between earth and skin, such as ring, bracelets, and watches. So if you have a ring, you take it off. Whereas in the ghusl, you don't have to take it off. You just move it enough to, right? And in wudu, you just t have to turn it. And then the sunan, wiping the arm up to and including the elbow. So the fard is just up to the wrist, sunnah up to the elbow. Uh, and then patting the earth a second time for the hands and then following the sequential order sequential order. Its recommended acts are saying Bismillah at the outset and then uh, the meritorious quality which is in, in the footnote uh, there. Wasfun Hamid. We don't have the... Uh, in the absence of water uh, of uh, performing tayammum. So in the absence of water, performing the tayammum at the end of the prayer time if one hopes to find water before then. So that's called the raji. So if you're a raji, if you think you're probably going to get water, you should wait till the last prayer time. Uh, the middle of the prayer time if one wavers between finding water or not. If you, I mean, the ulama differentiate between what's called dhan, shak, and waham. Dhan is, is, shak is where doubt, where uh, you're, it's completely equal. Whether something's going to happen or not happen, there, it's balanced. So if you're, if you're in doubt, you just don't know. So you think, maybe I will, maybe I won't. Then you wait till the middle. That's what he's saying there, if you're, if you're in the state of doubt. If you're in a state of lun, you know, the, the scale is that you'll probably find water, you wait till the end time. If you're in the state of waham, which is you don't think you'll find it, uh, then you do it at the beginning of the prayer time. Mm -hmm. What links are you expected to go to to find water? Like, I mean, they say, you know, they yeah, that's a good point. They say, you know, walking like a mile. You know, it's reasonable.
than uh, facing Qibla uh, and brushing one's teeth. So the Siwak also. I mean, that's Khalil adds that. So you face Qibla, and then also additions from Khalil. The following are discouraged acts of Taimum. Excessiveness, like hitting the earth hard, you know, or like rubbing the soil in there. This, it's, it's meant, it's a ritual. There's, you know, you have to really see it as a ritual. It's in, in place of wudu to create a kind of, uh, you know, a, a, just a psychological state that prepares you for getting into the prayer. So there shouldn't be any ghulu. And then repetition, you shouldn't do it like three times like you do wudu. Well, wudu three times must be good, so let's do it three times. And then speaking during tayammum other than resemblance. And then it's nullified by that which nullifies wudu, the availability of purifying water before one prays and there's enough time to perform the water ritual or catch the prayer on time. If water is found after performing the prayer but before its time elapses, in this case, it is recommended for one to perform wudu and repeat that prayer in the time of one's state when performing tayammum was one of the following. Fearful of a bandit, so if you're afraid of being robbed or something like that, hopeful of finding water, but nevertheless proceeds to pray during the beginning of the time, even though one is expected to wait until the end of the time, or a chronically ill person who lacked an assistant to fetch water. So if water is found after performing the prayer, but for, before the time elapses, it is recommended for one to perform wudu and repeat the prayer in, in the time if one's state when performing tayammum was one of the following. So. Those are the reasons that it would be, uh, you should repeat the prayer. And then if a significant time elapses after the performance of tayammum with no devotional action that requires ritual purification having been performed, a significant amount of time is the length of time it takes for the limbs of wudu to dry if they were wet in the moderate weather. The order, its order is saying bismillah from an intention in the heart while patting the pure earth using one of the following, obligatory tayammum, rendering worship permissible, and then rendering worship from greater ritual impurity, janaba if it was, patting the pure earth with the hands, wiping the face once, starting with the hairline down to the bottom of the chin, uh, patting the pure earth a second time, wiping the arm. So I'll, do, I'll just show you, if this was earth, you face the qibla, and then uh, you just make a tap, and then you, so you take off the ring, you, you make a tap, and then you, you, you do that to get the dust off, all right? So you, you tap like that, and then you start up here, and then come like that, all right? So that's, that's the face, and then one time, and then tap, and then go down like that to the elbow, and then up like that, and then in between the... Uh, and then down like that, down like that, and then like that. So that's time. If you do it with a rock, what's that? Oh, yeah. That <laughs> then, then you just cover the hand with the rock. That's kind of a small rock, but you, you could do it with that. So you just cover the hand with the rock like that. You don't do a tap. And then, uh, same thing. Okay, and then the second time. So, and, that, and the Prophet ﷺ, he said that, you know, the earth was made a source of purification for my ummah. So it's, it's just, this is earth purification as opposed to water.